Good evening, entrepreneurship students. You are in for a real treat today. Welcome to class. Thank you all for um, coming again on another uh, amazing week during this pandemic of virtual learning. Um, today, uh, we will be discussing competition and we will have a, a special guest speaker our first speaker of many that have agreed to speak to our classes. Um, I wanna thank you all again, and please feel free to, uh, please uh, again, open uh, your browser or your video option on so that we can have an interactive class. Our agenda today, we'll have some housekeeping. We'll have our guest presenter speak around 720. We'll have a quick lecture, in fact, I'll take that back. I'm going to switch it. We will have a brief lecture first, and then we'll have our speaker, um, and then we will uh, have Q and A. All right. Y'all seen that first? Housekeeping. Last week's video assignment. So I have published our PowerPoint presentation on Canvas under the file setting, but I have not. Um, I have not submitted the recording from yesterday, and that's because I am addressing a storage issue on my Canvas account. So please bear with me. Um, I have, has anyone tried to re-look at the video? I know a couple of people have. Um, I wanna see, I wanna know what people's experiences are with our past classes once upon review, how have things been looking. And people can either chat or you can unmute yourself and, and speak. Okay. Good deal. Well, I'm assuming that it hasn't been too much of an issue. If there's been an issue in retrieving the first two um, classes, please let me know via Canvas message or via email. Um, again, next, last week's class. I have the presentation, the slides, but I am still working on expanding my expanding my storage so that I can store last week's recording and this week's recording um, on Canvas. All right. Secondly, the CRED assignment rubric. Um, I will publish. It's already under the files folder in Canvas, but I will send via discussion the rubric for your CRED assignment which will be due in a couple of weeks. Um, this is an assignment um, that you all um, submitted your pre-survey last week on the last couple of weeks. Um, I am looking to see a paper, and this paper is supposed, is designed for you to think outside of the box in terms of what type of profession, what type of industry, uh, how you would like to work and operate um, to, uh, uh, to to have an effective work life balance. Um, so some of you all are entrepreneurs. Um, so that this will be an easier exercise. Some people uh, currently are seeking work um, or seeking employment. Um, I am not. This this assignment isn't to state that what you are doing or planning on doing is incorrect. It's just a thought. It's just a uh, it's just a philosophy to explore. And so I want you all to have an open mind with that. Um, some of you all are currently employed somewhere else. This is not a document or an assignment to encourage you to quit your job and do your own thing. This is really just um, an, an exercise to identify what you are truly passionate about. And if you had the option to create a job where you can receive uh, income to support you and your loved ones, how would that look optimally? And so uh, I want you to have that lens. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it next week, but I wanted to uh, let you know that I will provide the rubric to everyone via discussion and via slides in the next two days. All right? Good deal. Oh, sorry. Next, extra credit uh, opportunities. In the next few days, I will uh, populate Canvas with some more extra credit opportunities um, from the Career Center. Um, Arthur Lumsey have provided 
flyers and registration information um, to career services events at UNT Dallas. Um, there's also going to be a virtual housing forum that I am coordinating for the university that I'll invite you all and, and will provide that registration link um, on uh, Canvas so that you can have extra credit opportunities. These uh, opportunities will provide you anywhere from two to possibly 10 points, um, extra points on your, um, your, your comprehensive grade. So these are very significant. Um, I will also provide um, instructions um, or directions um, for submissions of your extra credit process, uh, extra credit assignment. Um, and one of them will be submitting a uh, half page, double spaced, about a paragraph or two, six to eight sentences, um, recap on what the event was and proof that you attended it, whether it is a snapshot of your computer screen um, of the actual presenters, um, and, and a mean, like I said earlier, a meaningful two paragraphs about what the event's for. But you will see those, that all, the, all of that information on the message boards. I uh, just wanted to let you know that it's coming down the pipeline. And finally, um, assignments in Canvas. Um, we, I have adjusted the case studies from chapters one through four. Um, I've added case studies assignments one, two, and three under week four. So you should all see those um, after this weekend. Uh, my expectation is that you all will play catch up from the, uh, with your textbook and we'll do the case studies for the first four chapters and submit them. Um, I will then grade them and then we'll be back on schedule for our uh, remaining assignments. Are there any questions? Okay. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So I noticed that uh, one of the assignments was the audio for the very short interview. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a required time on that? Like, do no. we? Okay. No, there's no required time. Um, and you should be able on Canvas to submit media recordings as well. So I should be able to listen to it. Um, the best way I have seen people do this is if they are either recording via audio or video that they um, uploaded it to their YouTube page and they use that hyperlink in their um, submission um, in Canvas to provide me the interview that way. So if you don't want to use too much storage um, in either your devices or you don't want, want to navigate all of these different um, files in Canvas, you can submit a hyperlink of a YouTube clip if you, can, if you know how to upload it on YouTube uh, on your page to watch it. And the other question is, so we have to just do a quick, uh, short introduction and then ask them our three or four questions that we had about their experience, correct? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. And keep in mind, you're going to have several assignments that's going to involve interviews. You may, you may have a follow, you may have to follow up with some of your entrepreneurs that you interview too. So that's all right. So just know that this, these lessons are so that you can build relationships because building relationships is very essential um, to providing the best product for potential customers. All right. Great question. I think that was from Marcella. Yes, it was. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? Great. I have a discussion question that I want us to explore for about five minutes, five to seven minutes until 720. And that question is, as an entrepreneur, well, what are some opportunities for entrepreneur that entrepreneurs can um, capitalize on or would want to do during this season to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month? What will be some business ventures? Um, and keep in mind during this pandemic that um, entrepreneurs, business owners, people who are either one passionate about um, Hispanic Heritage Month or the culture, um, or understands that there is a, a market um, to illuminate the celebration of this. 
Uh, I have heard, I've seen one response in the chat, create discounts during this time. Absolutely right. That is something that entrepreneurs can do. But uh, what, uh, Melina, what type of discounts? Well, are there products that this particular entrepreneur has? Uh, could you expound on that a little bit more? Can you hear me, Melina? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, okay, go probably just like setting up like a promo code um, regarding Hispanic Heritage Month or something like that. Great. So it can be an educational opportunity as well, right? So mm -hmm. let's just say what one thing uh, a company that does a fairly good job at it on a broad scale is Google. When there's a significant date and um, you can hover your mouse pad over the Google logo or you see there's some graphic art of something that's significant of that date, um, that allows you to kind of have a learning experience while using that product, right? You do the same with your products. Great job. Yeah. Good deal. Um, Bianca, you say create Hispanic oriented products. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. So like right now in our pandemic, we're using masks a lot. And so I've seen some people selling um, the ones with the embroidery of the traditional Mexican dresses and those like the coloring of it and stuff like that. Yes, exactly. And so it's funny that you say that because um, it's during this time of, uh, in the pandemic when people are working from home, um, that also gives you some time to pick up another hobby or pick up another skill. And one of those skills that I know my wife has been working on is sewing so that they can, she can create masks so that she can help build and develop uniforms for the wait staff at the restaurant her family owns. And she literally created a new business um, that is still associated with her family, but she's created her own business to where they can um, contract her to do that work and she can then possibly do work for other, other restaurants across the country. So, oh, smart. yeah, it's smart. And yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's enough Amazon packages of equipment coming to my house now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a great idea. Like, th th that's something that, especially um, during this season, you can create graphics that can illuminate Hispanic Heritage Month. And then what's after this? Halloween. That gives you an opportunity to create something for Halloween. What's after Halloween? Thanksgiving. What's after Thanksgiving? The holiday season where various religions are celebrating um, time and families just in general. Um, after that beginning of the year, you have MLK holiday. You have Valentine's Day. You have St. Patrick's Day. You have something every month that you can possibly use that particular material, that particular equipment to produce some type of product. And that can be a business for it, business for you. So um, thank you for for um, for submitting that, Bianca. Uh, Jeanette said, about oh, restaurants. Oh, yes, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. I'm always hungry. So I was thinking about restaurants that are already existing. They could highlight more cultural um, Hispanic food, um, especially um, highlight maybe some new dishes that's not traditionally, you know, thought of or already being served. Um, and or maybe even create um, uh, a, a different menu just to highlight the different foods that you know that are traditionally served around this time. That's a great point. <laughs> That's a great point. Quick, quick question, Carolyn. Why would that be? How can that positively benefit society? When when a restaurant it introduces, yeah. it introduces them to a new culture, and new foods, new tastes, new seasoning. Um, you know, um, it, it could also you know I have in the store sometimes I look in different fruits and vegetables and it's like what is this and I Google it and and it says oh traditionally in Mexican dishes blah 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 you know um, so that's just a learning experience. The more you learn about a culture, um, the better off you're going to be. Exactly. Exactly. Good deal. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jeanette uh, stated, make an e-commerce selling traditional Mexican dresses and sandals. Exactly. Especially if you have that skill set. I do have another question for that. Um, this and one thing that we want to also address that entrepreneurs always face when deciding to create a, a venture 
for profit is am I qual not qualified? Do will I effectively provide the best product, particularly if you're dealing with a culturally sensitive thing um, to, to avoid appropriation or to avoid um, some sort of, of copyright infringements or just cultural inaccuracies. Like as an entrepreneur, you have to identify, I can make this, but should I? Why do you think that's an important question for entrepreneurs to ask? They won't offend anyone. Okay. Why is offending someone important? Because we're supposed to live in a capitalist society. As long as I can make money, it should be all right, right? Well, that can lead to a lawsuit as well. Um, right. So then you're not making money. So, so let's just talk about the legal ramifications. If you want to decide to take this to court and you defend that you are in the right, you will still have to pay probably court fees or legal fees, things of that nature, correct? Right. Also, the cultural ramifications of that is, though you may be legally in the right, culturally or societally, that may affect the types of clientele you may have. So if you create a great product, business, but you alienate the culture that you're doing it for, who will be your primary customer, that may be detrimental to your business as well. Yeah. So what, what are some, thank you, Carolette, for, 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 for those examples. Does anyone else have any type of rationale or reasoning why um, this, uh, this, this is important to, to have those type of assessments? I think that um, I put one of my ideas in the chat, um, but it, just to answer your question, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's very important just to, you know, um, so I'm African American, and so I don't know a lot about Hispanic um, heritage, mm -hmm. right? And so if I'm gonna, um, so on my, on my, uh, on the chat, I put that an entrepreneur can maybe create like some type of app um, that just teaches people, like a fun app that teaches people about heritage um, and fun facts, and then maybe even, um, you know, local um, Hispanic owned like businesses and things like that, restaurants and things like that near them. Um, and so uh, just to kind of do that, whatever. But what you were saying was, why is it important? I think it's very important to, number one, that, that you're respectful and you don't um, offend anyone because, you know, that can completely backfire on you as far as, um, you know, you, you're trying to, um, like, let's just say if I, if I do the app or whatever it is, um, but I don't do research and I don't um, talk to, you know, some of my Hispanic friends to just really truly try to understand the culture. Um, I might say something or do something that I don't think is offensive, but it's like really offensive to other people, um, which it would backfire my business and um, that. And then as far as legal stuff, I don't know about that, but. <laughs> well, there will be another lesson in this class talking to just about business legal stuff anyway. And I'll bring an attorney to talk about that. The one I spend a lot, of, I pay a lot of money to hourly. So <laughs> that'll be fine. Um, but you're absolutely right. You're hitting the nail on the head. Um, and, a, and a lot of it is, is, is really a respect factor. And a lot of people have that sense of respect for other cultures it's when they have respect for their own culture. Or they've seen some, some people uh, misrepresent, to, to put mildly, your own cultural stuff. So you don't want to perpetuate that type of practice, correct? And so uh, that's a great thought. Thanks for that contribution, Holly. Thank you, everyone who added uh, in the chat feature, Apply Culture Mask, um, Mariah, thank you. Um, Jose, thank you, agree, Latin Design Influence Masks. Um, Holly, I just saw your response. I saw your, your app, thank you for that. Um, Marcella, would you explain a little bit more about your comment about making the barrier of entry much easier to get consumers? Um, what, was your, what was your thought on that? Marcella? Marcella, can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I, I wanted to expand on that. It kind of meant also taking advantage of how you said you know, being able to promote these kind of, you know, heritage appreciation and, and, and trying to give back to the community, really kind of using that as a, as a promotion in a sense, or really using maybe that opportunity to give back to others, whether it's, you know, kind of sponsoring, uh, maybe 
uh, a Latin uh, community that gives back to, you know, people or, or some form or fashion of kind of service. I think that that speaks sometimes more volumes. And while in the long term, it's uh, more of a, you know, something that you can kind of take a look at. It's not really something that you're going to get profit from the next day, but it's just kind of one of those good deeds and, and kind of reflects building that rapport for, for your company. Exactly. Oh, well, you're absolutely right. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you're absolutely right on that. And, and these are all questions. These are all assessments that entrepreneurs think of daily. And the, the subject matter changes slightly um, each day. Um, one day, it may be a cultural appropriation uh, issue. Um, the next day, it may be a legal issue. The next day is a logistical procedural issue. Can I even, once I produce the product that I can make, can I even send that, can I even transport that to our customers so that they can possibly get it in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right amount of time so that they can come back uh, for repeat business? And so all of these are just different ways, different things that entrepreneurs have to think of. And it's very important to be in tuned with what individuals and what groups of people are thinking in society, um, not for the vanity aspect of it, to where you just want to be accepted, but it's really important to understand the thought process of potential customers, potential consumers, and respect the types of belief systems that they have. One thing that if you don't understand cultural sensitivities, um, that can make or break your business. So I want you to think about that. Go ahead. This Marcella. I hey, think Marcella. for an entrepreneur, for me, yes, consumers are very important, but I also think your employees are very important mm -hmm. to them. So I know like for me, if I own my own company, I would probably give an extra PTO day, not just to define it on, you know, you use this for Hispanic Heritage Month, like today or Black History Month or whatever. You get this extra day to utilize it of your choice, meaning if you want to take MLK off, if you want to take off, you know, Cinco de Mayo, if you want to take off, you know, September 16th, that is your choice because it's a way that you give back to your employees as well. That's great. You're absolutely right. And th that is a key, um, key factor. If you remember from our first lesson, I stated that the employee, your work base, is probably your most vital human capital um, facet of your business because if you don't have a workforce that can produce your widgets or can provide the services to disseminate that to your customers, um, your business dies. And so it's very important to understand the needs of your employees as well and to uh, not only communicate but also respect and, and figure out a way both can exist because it's very important that bosses or that that owners provide a life or work-life balance for their employees. But it's also important that the boss or the owner discusses the importance of this business structure and the goals and plans so that everyone can be in accord, can, can be on one page in terms of, well, we work 50 to 60 hours a week, but it's not in vain. And two, we're doing something for good, whether it's having a better bottom line or we're impacting people or we're doing something that's going to contribute to society positively. Those conversations are very important to have with your, with your employees so that everyone can be on the same page, so that people won't have this feeling of abuse of time. A boss won't feel like all of a sudden an employee wants to take every cultural day off even if they don't exercise that culture um, or vice versa, um, the employees cannot feel that the bosses are very strict and inconsiderate. So it's important to have those discussions in a constructive manner, in a professional manner. All right? And it's great marketing too. And it's great marketing. It is great marketing, especially if you can do that and you're successful fiscally. And so it's, it's really important. We're going, we're deviating that off a little bit. I want us to get to our speaker, uh, but I want you all to think about, um, notice that after we present, after Dr. Slotum speaks, we're going to have a further discussion on competition. 
this, we're going to talk about indirect competition and direct competition. And I'm also going to provide you tools on what I'm expecting you, each group, each team to write from your midterm for competition. So that's, that's going to be very important after our presentation. But now um, I am honored uh, to, to introduce our speaker, our speaker this evening our very first speaker of our COVID, uh, our, our, our COVID educational uh, exploratory uh, opportunity in entrepreneurship 3850 um, is, is the one, the only, Dr. Suzanne Sloan. I'm going to read her bio and then I will have uh, Dr. Sloan um, talk to you in the class. Just this, and this is just gonna be a fireside chat there's no real structure. I didn't even I didn't even send Dr. Sloan questions for an interview. I just want us to all just to to be able to have a conversation, hear what she's doing in the community, some of the significant things that she's done, uh, but also from a lens of as an entrepreneur, how it's important to not only be great but to also invest in in people as well. So that's 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 the setup. This is the bio. Dr. Suzanne Slonum is the founder and medical director of the Fibroid Institute of Dallas. A pioneer in her profession, Dr. Slonum served as the first female medical staff president at Methodist Dallas Medical Center, where she also served as director of interventional, interventional radiology for 15 years. She left her large hospital-based radiology group to build an outpatient practice focused on providing concierge medical care to women seeking non-surgical treatment of uterine fibroids. Her honors include consistent recognition as a D Magazine Best Doctor and Texas Monthly Magazine Super Doctor. She is a 2020 Dallas Business Journal Women in Business Award honoree. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Suzanne Sloan. Thank you. That was, that was such a great introduction. I feel like I just won an Academy Award. It's wonderful. <laughs> I, I'm, I feel so honored to be here, and I'm, I'm so happy that I got to hear the discussion that happened at the beginning of this session because I learned a lot, and I was very impressed with some of the ideas, and I was you know, kind of getting excited about maybe taking a class until you brought up the midterm. <laughs> no way would I take a class if I had to take a midterm. That's it's a terrible. It's a necessary evil, Doc. Oh, it's yeah. Evil. Absolutely. No question. And believe me, I've taken my share of tests. Um, so actually, you did not give me guidelines, uh, except the, the most um, sketchy. And so I, I put together a quick PowerPoint that I wanted to show, if that's okay. Yes, in fact, let me share, let me try to share my screen so that you can view it. Give me two seconds. Can you all hear me okay? I like the exclamation point. That's, I'm gonna use that. Oh, no problem. That was free. <laughs> okay. Okay, I am going uh, to invite, I'm gonna make you a co-host so that it'll allow you to share your screen. Do you have it there? I think so. This will stop other screen sharing. That's quite all right. Okay. And then I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I'm going to start here uh, talking about building a medical practice because I'm a doctor and that's what I have, is a medical business. Um, so first of all, how many of you know what an interventional radiologist is? Okay, I figured that was not a big, uh, not a, not a well-known subject, so I'm gonna show you a quick video right here. Hi, Dr. Sloan. I want to treat your uterine fibroids. Actually, but I'm into medicine, not into it being anymore. My very first interview before they find me, I realized that there was this potential. I trained at Stanford Interventional, where we do 
all kinds of criminal procedures, especially with second surgery along with Professor Houston, I can't hear it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let's see if we can turn the volume just a little bit. I, I, it's difficult for me to hear as well. I'm stopping it and I'm going to uh, turn the volume up. All right. And, and what we can do, um, Doc, if you don't mind, if you could, if you don't mind sharing the presentation, I can also share it with the class. So that they can see, they can they'll be able to see it too. After is that class. something I want to do now or later? No, no, we can do that later. We'll do that later. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Dr. Sloan. Is that better? I want to treat your uterine fibroids. Yes. I went into medicine. I thought I was going to be an OBGYN. That was my very first thought. Then I thought I was going to be my surgeon. Finally, I realized that the way to go was interventional. I trained at Stanford Interventional, where we do all kinds of cutting edge procedures. Hysterectomy is such a common surgery. Oh my goodness. I feel pretty good after the week. Very good questions of getting themselves. More and more women finding on the internet they Google fibroids or fibroid information and then they don't want to just be given the one option of hysterectomy. They know what to expect. They can ask very good questions of what I can offer them, what the alternatives, what to expect. They are self-directed more and more. Women in the workplace, they don't want to be out after the direct after two months. They want to be able to return to work and feel pretty good after the week. And we can offer that solution. Once they've looked on the internet and found the procedure, then they come to me and they are given all the treatment options for fibroids, and they're empowered to make the decision themselves of what's best for them, for their lifestyle, for their work requirements, for their family, for their personal situation. It's a personal decision. And you make a good decision when you have the options laid out in front of you. And then once they go through the procedure, they can get back to their life without all the problems associated with their we strive to be very focused on the patient's experience, on your experience. I tell you, I don't believe in pain. I'm afraid of needles. I have to lie down and have to lie down because I'm so afraid of needles. And I think that makes me more compassionate. I imagine myself and my family member on the table when the procedure's going on, and I'm going to treat you like you're my sister. I don't want you to be uncomfortable. So the time has come for a center, whether you're in our center where we bake fresh cookies every day, it smells like when you walk in, to kind of make it convenient for you. Our hours are long. We start early in the morning. We stay late in the day. We see with the late procedure. We do consults out of several facilities, whether it's at our outpatient center, at one of the hospitals, at the hospital that's close to you, depending on where you live, to making sure that you're comfortable during the procedure, your family is comfortable during the procedure, we want them to be comfortable as well, and planning for your discharge. I always make sure that whoever's there with you has your prescription filled before you go home so that when you get home, you already have your pain medicine, you already have your muscle medicine. We focus on the details so that you're going to be as comfortable and relaxed as you can. Educate, empower, Enjoy life. Okay, so now we're going to play a little game called Raise Your Hand If. It used to be stand up, sit down if I were in the room with you. And uh, then I'd say, this, you know, raise your hand, uh, stand up if you brush your teeth today. And we'd see how many people stand up. Uh, since this is the new 2.0 version with the pandemic, we're going to do raise your hand. So just we're going to try it out. Raise your hand if you brushed your teeth today. Okay. All right. That's good. <laughs> okay. Hands down. Raise your hand if you left the house today. That one's a little more challenging. Yeah. Uh, we've got some with hands down. All right. Okay. Raise your hand if you already have an idea for business. Good, good, very exciting. Uh, hands down, raise your hand if 
you've already started a business. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, progress to be made there. Mm -hmm. And uh, raise your hand if you've ever thought about starting a medical business. Really? Okay. Uh, Maricela, what's are you in medicine in some way? I work for Baylor Scott and White, but so I run on the medical on the non clinical side, the billing sides, the revenue cycle side. Got it. Um, but my daughter is pursuing um, her education to become an orthopedic surgeon. Wow. So she wants to open her own practice. And so for me, that's the reason why I'm involved in the healthcare because as a family business, eventually our goal will be to run her business. Fantastic. I didn't see, is there anybody else on there with medical interest? I didn't see, okay. Jesus, uh, did I see you? Jesus. So what's, what's your, uh, your angle on the medical business? Uh, can you hear me? I yes. Hear. Yeah. Well, mine will be, in, um, mine's more of like a dental side of things. Sure. Yeah. I plan on, you know, opening my own practice someday. Excellent. Yeah. And this is, this is good training for it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to give you, I got a great introduction, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm born and raised in Miami, Florida. Um, both of my parents are doctors. And so from the time I was about five years old, I was working in my parents' office. I did everything from, you know, clean the floors to uh, interact with the patients and check their vital signs and do their EKGs and all the way to doing the books. So I have a unique exposure to an old fashioned uh, private medical practice, um, which is very valuable, I think, and has helped me a lot in starting my practice. For, as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a doctor. I have a brother who never wanted to be a doctor, uh, but for some reason it rubbed off on me. I'm an interventional radiologist. I don't know that that video really told you well what I do. I do minimally invasive image guided surgery. So I use x-ray and ultrasound and CT to guide procedures, invasive procedures in the body. So like what cardiologists do in the heart with balloons and stents, I do that in, in the other blood vessels and I use those same catheter-based techniques in all the other organs, okay? So minimally invasive, really uh, the way of the future. And I treat problems that are um, usually a, an interventional practice is based in a hospital and we treat patients who are, they have problems that medicines won't fix, you know, a pill won't fix it. And uh, often they are too sick for, for surgery. Uh, you know, somebody who's too, who's got a gallbladder problem, who's too sick, if we, they made a decision, they would die. They call me, I localize the gallbladder with ultrasound, put a tube in it through the skin, just like a little puncture and let the infected bile drain out. Okay, we don't need to go there. Um, but granted, it's a minimally invasive procedure. Uh, I've gone through all the traditional uh, training and I had a very traditional career in a hospital uh, until I identified a problem. So here's the problem. Uterine fibroids are are very, very common. They are non-cancerous tumors in the uterus and they affect a lot of women. 50 to 80% of all women have fibroids. 80% of black women have fibroids. Uh, it's about 50% in white women. Hispanics are in between there. Asians are the least likely to have fibroids. And they cause all kinds of unpleasant, terrible symptoms that I'm sure all the women on this uh, lecture know about. For example, these. And the, I, just, I just want to give you a brief uh, idea of what we're dealing with. This is a normal uterus. This is a, a slice down the middle of the body. This is the spine back here. Here's the bladder. The belly button is up here somewhere. Here's the belly button on this patient. This is a normal uterus. The white line is the endometrium. This is a uterus filled with fibroids. Okay, And this is typical. This is absolutely typical of what we see. Just each one of these dark circles is a fibroid, okay? Now, the usual 
and most common treatment option that is offered is a hysterectomy, okay? Um, I forget the statistics. It's something like, you know, 30% of all women by the age of 60 will have had a hysterectomy. So actual treatment options for fibroids include, include a whole lot of other options, okay? So here's the problem. Women are offered a hysterectomy, and a lot of women don't want a hysterectomy, and a lot of women don't want a surgery, and, and most women don't know that there are other options. So here's, this, here's my solution. This happens to be a procedure that is in my area of expertise. It's, it's a routine procedure for interventional radiologists. It's something that I happen to be very good at, and it's something that I feel passionate about. It bothers me that women are not offered their options. And, it, and I'm not saying, I, I think a hysterectomy is a great surgery for some women. What bothers me is that women aren't given the choice and they don't know it's there. And uh, they don't know that this procedure, 90% of the time, takes care of all the symptoms uh, without having a hysterectomy. So I uh, decided to build a business around uterine fibroid embolization. And I left my group uh, and I went to another practice, a small practice where um, I happened to know the guys that were, had started this practice. And I said, I, they said, do whatever you want. And I said, I want to treat uterine fibroids. They were like, really? That's, you know, that's not a great field. Then are you sure? And I was like, that's what I want to do. So I started out uh, marketing directly to the patients, to women. Okay. I went on the radio. I, I did get a web page. Um, I did set up a, a Facebook page. Um, I started doing things like having mixers in the office where I'd um, bring in some food and I'd put it out on the radio and I'd put it out on the internet that I'm going to have this event where I, and I bring someone of interest to the community. And I, I marketed very heavily to black women because black women make up probably, well, because black women have fibroids and now black women make up probably 80% of my practice. Uh, so when I went on the radio, I went on a smooth R&B station. When I went to social media, Facebook, a lot of black women are on Facebook. Um, when I had events, I brought in prominent black women to speak or to, um, you know, to be, I had DJs that were there. Um, I went to expos. I went to the African American expo at, uh, the university in Fort Worth. I did a lot. I went to churches. I went, um, I went to community centers. I went everywhere I could think of to let women know that there's an alternative to hysterectomy. That brought my business from A, or let's say from zero to maybe three. It was very, very labor intensive, um, but it got me started. In medicine, patients are kind of transferred among doctors. So if you hear about me on the radio and I say, come, you know, I'll do this procedure for you. You're going to say, well, I don't know you. I don't know your reputation. Uh, it's, it, it takes a lot to build trust with a patient. Whereas if your doctor tells you, go see Dr. Slonim, she knows what she's doing. She can take care of your fibroids. That is going to get, you're going to be much more comfortable with that. And so, whereas I found out early on that about, I don't know, 7% of patients that came to me from the radio ended up actually getting the UFE procedure. It's, it started from the beginning, it was more like 60, 70% of patients who came to me from another doctor ended up uh, getting the procedure. So I have to foster collaboration with other doctors. Now, gynecologists, a lot of gynecologists see me as competition. They want to do the surgery. They, and it's not that there's any malicious intent. That's what we're taught in medical school. When a woman's done with her uterus, take it out. Uh, they think that's what's best for the patients. And so when, they're, when they tell a patient you need a hysterectomy and the patient disappears, it doesn't really register to them. Or every year they come back and say, I'm having problems with my fibroids. And they say, you need a hysterectomy. And they say, no, I'm not doing it. A lot of doctors lose their patients that way. So I started reaching out to gynecologists. I'd go to their office 
and uh, you know bring them a, a tray of cookies or I'd get um, somebody who equipment vendors that I use to sponsor lunches for the gynecologist offices and uh, I was able to show gynecologists that number one um, they were losing patients to me because literally thousands of women have come to me behind the backs of their gynecologists and every time they do I say do you mind if I just let your gynecologist know that we talked about this and I send them a note hey I saw your patient she doesn't want to have you know she's we're going to treat her fibroids we're going to do this procedure and then I send them back to the gynecologist so they realize oh I don't lose the patient if I if they go and have the UFE and then they come back to me, then I, I have another, you know, my patient stays with me for the rest of my career. So I had to transition from being a competitor to a resource. Mm. Um, so yeah, and, any questions at this point? Oh, okay. no, keep going. I will we'll have okay. the Q&A section. Okay. Sure. All right. So that was how I sort of, what did I call that? I call that building the business. I had to build the brand and this is, these coexisted. Um, so the patients are not going to come to you if you're not taking excellent care of them, or if they do, they're not going to come back. Um, and so I built this business on top notch service. Every time uh, we got a click on our website saying I'm interested in information, that patient was answered within an hour um, by me personally. I would call each patient who contacted us on the website. I, you know, anybody who sent us a message, I'd call them directly. Um, you know, we we did whatever we could to get to make it convenient for the patients. Um, just as importantly, you have to make it easy for the referring doctors. In fact, I, I put their hamper the referring doctors. And that is exactly what I mean. They do not want to have extra work because their patient is having a UFE. So we made it, uh, you know, a one, two, three referral. All they have to do is you know, they can fax or email us this sheet that they just a check, check, check what they want. And we take care of everything else. We've got it. We need the patient's name and phone number. We take care of everything else. It's really bad if a gynecologist gets a call from uh, the patient saying, I just got out of the hospital and um, so when do you want me to come in and see you? And they didn't know that you were in the hospital. You keep the gynecologist informed about everything, but don't be a pest. It's a fine line. You wanna make it easy for them, but not, um, but not be a pest. There's nothing a doctor hates worse than having to deal with another doctor's problems. So if I have a patient who's having nausea, I don't want her to call the gynecologist. I want her to call me and I'll take care of the nausea. I want to make it easy for the gynecologist. I don't want her to have to deal with any of the patient's problems. That's what I'm here for. And when, I'm, when I've treated the fibroids and I've done the follow-up, I'm sure the patient is fine. I send her back to the gynecologist, wrapped in a bow. Her symptoms are gone. She just needs her well woman exams now. And if there's problems about the fibroids, come back to me. Uh, and then finally, stay on message. There's never a conversation I have with another doctor or even you know, with a woman who's coming in where I say, I treat fibroids without surgery. I treat fibroids without surgery. It's, it's you know, the elevator pitch, what do you do? I treat fibroids without surgery. Everything is not rosy. You know, I started the practice in March. I didn't get my first case until May. Uh, starting a business is about sacrifice. I went nine months without pay. Yeah, I joined these guys, but they were not interested in the UFE practice. Why should they have to you know, support me if this is my baby, my idea? So nine months without pay. Um, I had lots of days when I'd have a great, a full schedule of patients who are interested in having the procedure. I'm thinking, great, I'm finally going to get some patients. And eight of 10 patients would not show up for days in a row. Um, and it was not easy to build traction with referring docs. It takes persistence, it takes convincing, it takes reliability. Uh, so it's, I'm sure you all know, anyone who has started a business, it's, it definitely, you have, to, you have to be passionate about it or it's not gonna fly because it takes hard work. So, but you get past the roadblocks. Um, so in my first year, 
there were three doctors who referred patients to me and total of six patients were referred, okay? This year, I have over 200 doctors referring to me and I've had 381 patients referred so far this year and it's projected at the rate we're going, it'll be over 500 by the end of the year. So I'm very proud of that. I'm very, and I'm very uh, happy, very, uh, I feel secure in my business at this point. I, I'm never secure enough that I'm not gonna work hard and provide good service, but I, I feel much better than when there were only three doctors referring to me. In my first year, I did 47 procedures. This year, I'm doing over 350. So <laughs> again, this is, the procedures are where I make my living. Uh, the, you know, talking to the patients and the consults, I wouldn't have a practice without it, but I don't, you know, either I don't get paid or I get paid very little for that. The UFE procedure is where, is how I make my living. First year, uh, the revenue for the business was under 500,000. This year, it's gonna probably, very likely be over three and a half million. So that's my story. Any questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So just because I know on radiology side and all the equipment and the cost and all that, and I saw that you mentioned your first year, you were uh, right under 500,000. Yes. How did you financially start the business with? Yeah, it's tough. Um, should I unshare my screen? I'm gonna unshare my screen. Okay, so um, a lot of it was a lot of it was my saved money. A lot of it was um, loans. You know, I, I got some. I, I borrowed some money, and um, okay, that was it. Actually, it was my money, and it was it was lent money to build the business. And luckily it did take off and I was able to pay the money back and, and feel comfortable about it. It's a risk, there's no doubt about it. It's a risk to do it. That's part of being an entrepreneur. Yep, thank you. Uh, Matt, we can't hear you. I have a quick question. And then yeah. and again, most of the, this would be my only question, at least to right now, then I'll give it to the rest of the students because okay. you did an amazing job. Thank, um, you. thank you for your presentation. and. I purposely left it sketchy because um, I'm an avant-garde type type artist. And so I know that you definitely are a Picasso with you there. So you did an amazing job with Thank that. You. Thank you. Um, you initially talked about uh, going into the African-American community and your strategy. And, and it, tied, it tied into what our conversation was earlier in our discussion and and your position. Could, could you talk a little bit about that process and figuring out uh, maybe some, how do you navigate through that space in order to get to serve um, the needs and the journey? It's a great question. Um, so I did not know how to navigate in the black community. Um, I have some black friends. Uh, I think I'm, I guess, a pretty typical middle-aged white woman, I didn't have a whole lot of black friends. And so I did not want to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. I don't know if any of you know Gail Warrior. She's oh, a yeah. woman who, I see some nods there. Okay, she's a very good friend of mine. And so I called Gail and said, Gail, I want to start this business. Uh, it, it affects black women. And I want to use your Rolodex. I want you to help me. And I asked her to set up a, what did we call it? We called it Women of Influence. We set up a Women of Influence luncheon where I asked her to bring in, and it wasn't all black women by any means. We brought in business women. We brought in um, women who are well-known in the black community. We brought in uh, uh, women in uh, media. You know, we, I, I brought in a newspaper publisher. So some of them were my contacts, some of them were Gail's contacts. And we had a luncheon at, what was it called? What's the club that Gail belongs to? Downtown Dallas? The Tower, Tower Club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had it at the Tower Club. We, you know, we had lunch. And again, I got, sorry about that. I got a, um, the company 
So I block the blood vessels and the fibroids with little particles that are FDA approved to do it. So I got the um, woman who sells those particles to sponsor the lunch. You know, she paid for the food and, and some uh, drinks. And we brought this group together and we said, how should I build this business? How do, how do I reach out to the black community? Who else should I reach out to? What resources do I need? What approach do I need to take? And we took copious notes. I mean, pages of every time there was like a brainstorming session of all these very smart women. I don't think there were any men there, uh, except the, our radio guy. He, he had gotten, a, um, lady, lady Jade was lady there. Jade. Mm -hmm. Lady Jade was there and we got, uh, Lady Jade through Corey is a friend of ours. Uh, oh yeah, no Corey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Corey introduced me to those radio stations, and um, so we made we I we took all the notes. I made a list, and we went one by one, and we did every single thing on that list, and um, it, it was successful. I mean, it's it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of get, reaching out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, you know, expanding your boundaries and sticking with it. I mean, and I've gone back to Gail several times uh, and I've gone to other women several times. But now, now I, I have a much better feel of what to do. And I, uh, I'm, I still reach out to any expert that I can find. I'm, I'm like a sponge for, for advice. Thank you for answering that. I leave. I open it up back to the class. If you if you have a question in the middle of um, Dr. Sloan's explanation, you can also provide it in the chat, and then I'll uh, I'll present it to her. Or Dr. Sloan can read it out off the chat too. Mine wasn't really a question; it's more of a comment. Okay. Um. So I know I thought that was really awesome. Um. That you said that. So basically, you you're you said that um, basically that you pivoted your business um, by being a resource than competition. And I think that's really, really important. Um, the fact that you highlighted that because, um, you know, I don't have a business, but I always, you know, read a lot of books and different things like that. But I know that, that there could be times when, um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, let's just say Blockbuster, right? Um, how they basically went under because they didn't pivot and uh go online um you know uh, whenever when Redbox and all this other kind of stuff was coming out so i think that's uh super important and, and and thank you for sharing that um that you did make that pivot in your business and then now you know it's it's been a success since then and also i looked at your um i, I looked you up online just now your um your youtube uh a channel i was going to tell you as a suggestion maybe to do a, a testimonials but you already have it on here and it looks like all, all the women on here are um extremely happy so that's that's great thank you thank you very much yeah i got feedback that black women go to go to uh, testimonials and uh, facebook more than anything else so i'm there i'm now i'm i'm on twitter and i'm not great at social media because i'm kind of a little bit too I'm comfortable on Facebook, but Twitter and Instagram are, feel very foreign. It's fast moving, that yeah, Instagram it is. and Twitter. It is. What do and, you guys suggest? Where else should I be? Are you on LinkedIn already? I'm sure you are. We're building that now. It's actually, okay. I'm going through the proofs. We're building it now. And we're going to be, we're actually going to be reaching out to gynecologists more than for patients on LinkedIn. Hmm. I'm not sure if, um, uh, as far as like the age range, uh, but um, a lot of people they do. I've seen like doctor videos and everything, um, like fun videos, like on TikTok. You know, I was gonna say yeah. that. Oh my god, yeah. I didn't want to be the one to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, like tic, you know, TikTok. That's that's the way to go too. And then even Instagram. If you don't want to do Instagram, they even have. Uh, I mean, not TikTok. Uh, IGTV. TikTok. Yeah, they have that, and then also they have the the Instagram IGTV. reels now. Yeah, I did. I I hosted my first Instagram live. What uh, it was on last week. I I my first one. I was very nervous, but it it seemed to go okay. I I co-hosted with uh, a woman named Fibroid Queen who's in Houston, and she does holistic approaches to uh, managing fibroid symptoms. Wow. 
you know what I'd like? I see that there's a lot of Hispanic people on this uh, in this class, and um, I feel as if I under market to the Hispanic community. I'm get I do get some Hispanic patients, but uh, I feel like they don't know who I am, and um, I would like to reach out more to Hispanic community. Any ideas? Anyone, please feel free to, to if, share. If you think of anything, just reach out. I'm, and what, I'm, and what I, I will also provide, I'll also provide Dr. Sloan's email address to everyone as well. Okay. Yeah, well, me speaking, I'm Hispanic. And usually when there's like a problem related to like kidney stones or this or that, our first um, solution is usually like teas or like pills or whatnot. We don't actually go to doctors. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> okay, that's, that's important. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I guess pills, I, I mean, I don't think there's a way to fix, you know, in your area. I don't think you can sell pills to fix, you know, what you're fixing. So. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any suggestions, really. Well, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? You're welcome. I hear you. Hi, this is Marcelo speaking. I don't, I don't have my camera on. You know, one of the suggestions that I would make, I think, for the Hispanic community, I think that uh, a lot of uh, Hispanic uh, individuals have families, right? They're family people. And so I think it starts sometimes in the schools. Obviously, I think right now it's kind of difficult with everything that's going on. But I like that idea of kind of those seminars and kind of those events. I think if you partnered with maybe a school, an elementary school, uh, primarily Hispanic, right? Like Irving or uh, Mesquite, right? Those areas where it's predominantly Hispanic uh, and having a session, an afternoon session or a weekend session or some kind of, you know, talk with women about fibrosis and kind of answering their questions, providing value and kind of promoting yourself in that sense. I think that's really valuable. Are you saying have a community event at a school? Is that what you're saying? I mean, obviously, because of everything that's, that's going on. Idea. Yeah, I mean, because of everything that's going on, you know, it'd yeah, be more I of like right now the, the pandemic, but that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that would, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, I agree. Because it's especially when in elementary school, where there's the most parental engagement, right. for sure, oh, that'd be good. That's a that's great, a great that's a great point. Thanks, Thanks, similar to that, I was going to say, since this is Hispanic Heritage Month, that um, I don't know if there, there are any planned events right now going on, but if you could um, speak or make a presentation or something as a pass out business cards, maybe. What, uh, what kind of venue? Church? Uh, I know here in Fort Worth, they have um, a place called like Gran Plaza. It's like a swap game, you can say. It's all indoors. It's like a big mall. Um, and I know that there, they, there's a lot of like Hispanics that go and visit there or like bazaars. Okay. What's Something the place called sort. in Fort Worth? It's Look. called La Gran Plaza. La Gran Plaza. Okay. Yeah. So this is Marcella again. Okay. Um, I've I worked in the construction industry for 14 years before I went into the medical side. And I think from the construction side, they offer insurance, but the problem is the males don't know how to tell their wives, hey, here's some information they come across because like um, Marcello had mentioned earlier, they stay home, they do their self remedies and so forth. I think a great start would be getting some information out to construction companies to provide, whether it's a flyer to their um, workers doing open enrollment or something like that might be a great hit. Or also, like they mentioned, getting out to the community, whether it's churches and stuff like that as well. Could, you make, could you make an introduction for me? Of course. Company? Yes. Um, the other thing is, I know for Baylor Uptown, what we did when we um, opened up our front doors, we sent out mail cards around that particular zip code to attract more people in that were closer to that zip code range. Okay. I don't know what zip code your business is in, if it attracts the Hispanic community or not, but for your business, that might be a mailer, I guess, like, better like words. That's it. Okay. All right. Gosh, I'm running out of room to write here. Okay. <laughs> 
or, or find out what those zip codes are where a lot of Hispanics live and just send it out to that zip code that's closest to your business. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. This is, this is Marcelo again, kind of okay. adding on. I just kind of thought of something as everyone's kind of throwing out ideas, which is good. Um, I think that uh, a big part of kind of the Hispanic community, I think everyone just in general, everyone loves free things, right? So yeah. if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you advertise and not necessarily providing a free product, right? Or putting something with your name on it, but more of saying free consultations or free something like that, you know, and, and gratis or, you know, something like that on, on some kind of flyer or pamphlet, kind of how she, you know, kind of how Marcelo had stated. Uh, I think that would attract, you know, uh, more right. people to, to wanting to kind of give it the opportunity. That's, that's a great idea. We're doing a back to school special now for September that, awesome. uh, that it's consults are free for any teachers or anyone related to the school. So that's a, uh, but I like the idea uh, for this month doing a Hispanic promotion. Awesome. Do most of your referrals come from gynecologists or do you also get them from um, like regular family CPs. doctors as well? Uh, we, uh, they're, most are from gynecologists, but we have started reaching out to family practice and internists. Mm -hmm. We also reach out to hematologists because these women get so anemic. I have patients who get a blood transfusion every month mm -hmm. and, you know, if you just stop the bleeding, mm -hmm. then that, that wouldn't be necessary. So, uh, but, but we are getting a little bit more from, from primary care docs. Okay, well, I would say um, maybe like the Hispanic oriented primary care doctors, like me, doctor, um, who I know my like a majority of my family uses that. It, I don't know it, what it is. So I am familiar with me, doctor. Is there mm -hmm. what, what did you say before that? Um, I'm, is, I'm sorry, I lost Is, there, I lost a, is there like a Hispanic primary care network, do you know? Well, like the, for instance, it's since I think it opened or as far as I can remember it being open, my family has gone to them because of the fact of like, it's me, so it's Spanish and okay. uh, focusing towards that. So, I mean, I, we've always gone to those. I take my kids to me, doctor, pediatricians still. And it's okay. just from the fact that I've been with them since I was little. Okay, that's a great idea. Hello. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, um, that I think, uh, as far as, I don't know if you're already doing or not, but not but like leaving brochures at like local, um, whether it's, you know, um, um, uh, Hispanic owned businesses or, uh, whatever, but you can, you can leave like your brochure with, um, with either like you were talking about gynecologist or even like, um, local um, businesses that maybe cater to whatever you're doing. Um, uh, so like, like for instance, for me, uh, if I wanna get my hair braided, right, I'll go to a beauty salon and then, um, I'm in a hair store and then there they'll have cards for local people right. who braid hair, you know, things like that. Right, right, yeah, that's good, that's good. I think I need to spend some time in some Hispanic community, uh, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I know for grocery black stores. community, <laughs> grocery stores, that's okay. Yes, yeah, that's true. Super Mercado. Yeah. Uh, super Mercado I know to go to nail there. salons and, and hair salons for black women, but I haven't really been able to, you know, now I'm thinking more about where to go for the Hispanics. I will say this. <clears throat> I think it's important to reach the younger generation. So like younger generations will always influence the parents because the parents as Hispanics, they don't trust a lot. So when they hear their kids on them that it's important to do this. So maybe starting in the younger generation and not really go just directly for the big ones, the older age. That's very interesting. That you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Very true. But let me ask you this. How likely is it for a Hispanic mother to discuss fibroids with her daughter not very likely but yeah. that's where the daughter will come in to tell her you're you've been talking to me about you're always in pain this way and you've already done this and you've done that um you know i got this for sure i talked to this individual who gave a free consultation so they could understand what yeah. are the symptoms what it's are managing the symptoms, up and it's all matching up so yeah. they encourage that person to go with them that's great uh, yeah. you know what i mean yeah yeah thank you uh -huh. matt how are we doing on time um, uh, let's see, you have a 
two more minutes. Okay. Are there any other questions, comments, or let's say, are there any closing thoughts, uh, Dr. Sloan, that you have um, in, your, in your remaining two minutes? I am super impressed uh, with you. Um, I had my daughter listen to you and say, look, listen, just listen to her. And so behind the scenes, she's just smiling. Um, I think you're a huge advocate for females um, starting thank their own business. So thank you. Also, thank you always for giving back to the community and actually always wanting to go that extra mile. It sounds like now you're interested in the Hispanic community. So um, I wish you all the success. Thank you very much. And same to you guys. I mean, congratulations to all of you for taking the step of taking this course. Thank you. There we go. Would promote this book. Hey, Reap, I wrote this book to help get the message out. It's very, uh, it's very easy to read, and it, it tells everything about miserable periods and how you can treat them or what the options are. And it's got a lot of fibroid stuff. Um, and I'll tell you, by the way, in terms of an educational point, it is it gives you so much credibility to write a book. Uh, it's an incredibly good marketing tool. And that's the only reason I did it was to be able to say, here, read this book on, on treating fibroids. And it, it, I mean, it's great information. It has, it tells you everything you need to know. Anyway, I, I would say, write a book, get, I saw an ad on Facebook and said, you know, it said, you know, doctors can expand their business by writing a book. I took the class. I did it. It is, it's a lot of work but it is worth it, so. Wow, wow, Your, the professor may need to take that course. Um, <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez, did I, I see you have, a, you, you have a raised hand? Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, do you have that book in Spanish? We don't have the book in Spanish, but we have all of our brochures and other paperwork in Spanish. Perfect, I, I was I, also I, gonna ask, cause um, I think uh, another classmate mentioned that you had a YouTube channel. Do you have any videos there that are like in Spanish? We have a couple that are in Spanish and we're, we're making some more. Uh, I found, you know, the Spanish women are a little more shy about doing testimonials. Yeah, well, I'm a dental assistant and usually whenever we get like PSSCs or whatnot, or like, you know, they whenever we try to explain to the parents that they're gonna need a crown, they're usually like very, but very, very skeptical regarding like anesthesia and this and yeah. that. So yeah. like, if you, I don't know, I mean, this is just a, you know, out of the blue suggestion, but I would just suggest, so I, I guess sort of like explain the procedure, you know, anesthesia wise, like what's going to happen, what, what okay. goes into it. I'm going to make a note about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, a lot yeah. of women are worried about anesthesia. Yeah. For example, parents, in my case, whenever I, we're trying to explain them, they're even scared of not laughing gas, like of the nitrous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we, we have to explain that in very detail, like a lot. And then um, I would recommend it's like somebody making the video in Spanish okay. because I have had, um, you know, encounters where I try to tell the kid, you know, to explain it to his mom, but he doesn't know Spanish very well. So it's sort yeah. of like that barrier. That's a good point. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank That's you. my little suggestion. That was a great suggestion. And also, uh, Dr. Sloan, would you mind typing in your email address in the chat box? No problem. The chat I have available is private with you. No, so there's an option. Well, if you send it to me, I will send it to everyone else. Um, everyone publicly and privately? Yes. Everyone, okay. Public, yes, everyone. Mm -hmm. And also, I just wanted to thank you for coming on and thank you, uh, Professor Houston, for having her as well. Because um, I honestly, you know, I'm, I'm 27 and I didn't know anything about fibroids or anything. So when you were doing your presentation, I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> let, me, let me pay attention to this. Yeah. Go to my so, website, fibroidfree.com. Yeah. And, and you can get the book for free. It's an ebook you can download if you put in your email address. Oh, I'll okay. do that right oh, now. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I, and men need to learn, know this also. Yeah, I have um, testimonials from it, men on yeah. my site. It's, it's funny because it's not funny. It's actually very serious, but it was, I was very enlightened when this affected me, when my friends, actually my girlfriend at the time had fibroids and she needed a surgery and I had to absorb all of this information that I was unfamiliar with. Yeah. And that not only helped me in my life after, but also with my, interacting with my sister, with my mom, now my yeah. wife, 
who, yeah. who also have fibroids. And so that that's something that's that everyone and that needs to take seriously and, and really know so that we can ensure that everyone's healthy. So good. Yeah. This has been so. fantastic. Yay! Life you. life at UNT Dallas. This is what happens. There you go. When you when you interact with trailblazers. There you Dr. go. Dot Slum, thank you. Thank you for sharing your information. And and thank you for investing in our lives. Uh, this has truly been amazing. My pleasure and, and my benefit. Thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you. you. You're welcome to join us any anytime on Wednesday. Thank you. All right. You have a good one. Good deal. That was a great presentation. Um, Dr. Stoneham is an amazing woman. As you as you heard, she's very decorated. Um, she is awarded. She was awarded the 2020 Dallas Business Journal um, um, Women Business Leaders of the Year. Um, so she is uh, amazing. Thank you all for being so attentive. Thank you for being engaged. Um, yeah, y'all are awesome. That's all I want to say. Okay, that's it. I'm not getting emotional. Next slide. We're going to talk about competition. And this is going to be a brief. It's 820 now. Um, I know one of the questions, I think someone submitted a Canvas uh, message to me asking if I would, ha will I have the presenta her presentation available in Canvas? I will request it, request it from her and will uh, post it in Canvas um, once she sends it to me. So you all will have uh, that presentation as well. But let's talk a little bit about competition, and I want to talk specifically on what I expect on your midterms, okay? But before we get started, let me give you a definition of, of, of competition. Competition is the, is the rivalry between companies selling similar products and services with the goal of achieving revenue profit and market share growth let me say that again competition is the rivalry or beef or territorial type of tug of war um, between companies selling similar products and services with the goal of achieving revenue profit and market share growth now an example of this is something that i spoke on last week that's the food service industry um, does anyone remember what my example, what was my, one of my main examples um, from last week? Was it the fast food and the... Um... Exactly. Yes. Exactly. It was Chick-fil-A and Chili's. Yes. And ch I, I said that was the, di that was, those are indirect competitors. But Chick-fil-A and Chili's are rivals because they sell similar products, food, it's a food service deal, and they both have the goal of achieving revenue, profit, which revenue is different than profit, a quick crash course business one-on-one. Revenue is just, the, it's just the action of receiving cash into your business. That does not mean that you're making a profit yet. That just means money is coming in you can still be at a deficit. The money that comes in does not become profit until you have cleared the threshold of all of your bills being paid and you've covered all of the expenses you need to where you can, can, you can store or, or profit or you can uh, benefit off the your rest of your earnings. Wanted to say that first. And market share growth. Market share growth, you may not make the most money, but if you're able to dominate the customer base, meaning more customers are going to you than your competitors, that places you at an advantage. So that's what the compet competition is the science of this rivalry. It's important to know this um, because this will help you maximize your profitability or your effectiveness as a business. It's really important to know where your rivals are because typically where there's a rival, there's already a, um, an existing customer base. 
And as an entrepreneur, one thing that you should do is to identify where you can find people that want your product. So if you know where your competitors are or are not, that can help you determine what type of product you're producing, where you're going to produce it, and how you will disseminate that product to your customer. It's very important to know that key thing. Competition is separated into two separate um, facets. One is direct competition, which we spoke on earlier. It is the competition and rivalry between companies selling similar products and services that are within the same demographic. So for Chick-fil-A, a direct competitor to them would be McDonald's, Burger King, and an out Burger, which I explained last week. Those same type of restaurants who have drive throughs who have the similar demographic of price range, so between five and twelve dollars per meal, um, that that attributes to uh, direct competitors, and the fact that they are the primary um, goal is to get fast food out as quick as possible um, shows that they're direct competitors. Indirect competitors, like I said, Chili's. It's a higher price point. It's more of a sit-down restaurant, and they have a different um, uh, varieties of foods. Another example of competition outside of the food industry um, could be in insurance. So Aflac is a direct competitor to Liberty Mutual. It's a great example. The reason why I say that is because we see those commercials on TV all the time. All states. All of them are direct competitors. Why? Because they are specifically in the industry trying to get individuals to get insurance policies. And, when, and they're going for the same person, same demographic, and they are producing very, very, very similar products to individual customers. Now, uh, an example of an indirect competitor in the insurance agency could be, let's say, Aflac, and then let's now say a, an insurance company or an insurance house that is germane specifically to only your workplace, whereas it's only benefits that you, let's say, TRS. If you work with the state of Texas, you have your own separate insurance company. There are more indirect competitors uh, because it could limit the amount of demographics. Um, you have to be an employee of the state to be a part of that insurance, or they can provide different products or services. But it's not a blanketed type of service, uh, insurance service, that's similar to an AFLAC or to um, Liberty Mutual or an Allstate. Any questions on that? No? Okay. I want to show a couple of videos. Let me see if these videos will work. Hopefully they will. There we go. Tell me if you can hear them. For decades, riding in a taxi stayed the same miserable experience. They were hard to find, expensive and unpleasant at best, all because competitors were prevented from entering the market. But then Uber and Lyft came along and figured out a way to challenge the local taxi cab monopolies. And what happened? Prices dropped, rides became easier to find, and quality went up. Way up. This is why competition is fundamentally important. Competition is the only force that consistently leads to lower prices and better quality goods and services, improving our daily lives. If an industry is shielded from competition, then the companies within those industries can keep prices high with little incentive to innovate. But as soon as a new competitor joins the market and does something better, faster, or cheaper, then the other companies can either adapt and compete to stay relevant or not. Either way is a win for consumers. Some businesses will succeed, some will fail. But as long as the market remains open to new competition, then prices will stay low and innovation will continue. Any thoughts on that video? I think that. Sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was going to say, I think that um, definitely directly relates to what I was saying, um, what I was telling uh, uh, the doctor about how Blockbuster, how they didn't Mm -hmm. um, pivot, and then they end up, you know, to online streaming services, and then ended up, you know, there's only one left now in the world, so. Right. Yeah. Good. No, you're absolutely right. Um, I I noticed that they they had several examples in this minute and a half or so. One was the taxi cab, right? Do people remember the life pre-Uber or pre-Lyft, um, like taxis. Can somebody talk to me a little bit about that world, the taxi cab world? It wasn't really big in Dallas, but this is big in other metropolitan cities. They were expensive and they were only used for like airport travel or like a mm-hmm. business person um, who wasn't from Dallas normally, but they were not very, I didn't see very many um, taxis actually I think I only really saw taxis around downtown mm-hmm. um, or like I said the airport areas and then when Uber and Lyft came along um, like it said it um, gave them competition um, I think taxis did it kind of run them out of business because Uber and Lyft is so much cheaper mm-hmm. um, the only taxis I really see now or when I go out of town and I'm like in New York or Vegas or something like that, but I still don't see very many of them. Right. Exactly. And so um, to answer your question, yes, Uber and Lyft did um, grossly affect their market share to where it, it took a lot of taxi cab companies out of business. They're not totally out of business yet, but the, the effects of Uber and, and Lyft really did significantly impact the, the price barrier of taxi cabs. You're absolutely right. Uh, it used to cost $70 for me to get a taxi cab from my house in Oak Cliff to DFW Airport. And now I could do that for $20, right? With a tip. I could catch a dart train for like $3 from my place where when I would get to a rail station to DFW airport. And so as innovation happens, um, it, it drastically affects um, that, that industry. Another thing that I was really um, impressed by when Uber and when Lyft uh, entered the, the field is the cleanliness of, of cars. And so one thing about taxis, taxis were so dirty. And I used to always take taxis in D.C. and in New York um, because I used to travel there for business. And experiencing a taxi then uh, compared to catching an Uber or Lyft now, whereas some Uber or Lyft drivers provide mints and drinks to you. Like that was unheard of in the tax cap. And so competition really helps Um, business owners um, stay on their game because the market is driven by consumer beliefs and consumer direction. And so if the community, if the consumer demands, you know what, it's too expensive for me to be driving this. I'll either get another car or I'll use another company, but I'm not going to pay $75 again to drive to the airport one way. Right. That's how competition can be great. Now, how can competition be bad? Does anyone have any idea? Over competition could um, sat, satur- like oversaturate the, like the entire industry. Mm-hmm. Say, uh, like right now, there's been a lot of streaming services. And so the prices are are basically they're reflecting back to what people were paying for cable. If every, if one person decides that they want every single streaming service they can buy that's out there, they end up paying like maybe like seventy dollars right now, uh, eighty dollars, and, and that and like the focus that the, the appeal that they had is no longer there. Mm-hmm. That's a, Jose, that's a great assessment because initially, and and they actually use the cable cutting as an example of good competition here, which I do agree. Um, It's a great competition because I remember back in my day when I had cable, there was the box. It was 44B. Y'all don't know nothing about that. But, um, (laughs) But when cable started happening and it started 
paying, we were starting to pay more than $100 a month for programming, it was getting frustrated. And so um, Redbox started when you were shipping DVDs from, from, from the stores, then Netflix did the video, then Netflix started streaming. And Netflix used to cost $5 a month. I came, I'm really aging myself because I saw my Netflix bill last week for $17.99 and I blew a gasket. And so, but that was the, the exact point that you made, Jose. I now own maybe 10 streaming services and I'm paying $15 to $20 a month. So I'm paying about $150, $200 a month on the same thing that I was frustrated with, with cable services. And so that's, that, that could be a, a negative facet of competition in that you drop the barrier of, the price barrier drops. And so you have the impulse to buy multiple things and you're buying the same thing that you bought when you were just, uh, when you had the original cable. So great assessment on that. All right, let's listen to this video. And then we will we will start wrapping up. I, I wanna, Another one is cell phones too. Great point. Cell phones is a great point. When they were big <laughs> block cell phones, um, they were hundreds of dollars. Um, you would have to pay. People, do y'all remember night nighttime and weekend minutes? Yeah, that's what they that. nine, nine o'clock is when like look, I can't talk to you after <laughs> nine, and then or the weekends, and then after that it, they moved to seven. I'm like oh, I want that T-Mobile because you can mm -hmm. get, you can get the flip. Talk to people on the keyboard. Eggs start talking at seven o'clock. <laughs> all you're running up my minutes. That's what I'm saying. You're running up the minutes. You only, only got nine, only got 180 minutes on this thing. Mm -hmm. what, what you want? This is three o'clock in the day. <laughs> now it's three minutes. Short now conversation. Three minutes. Short. Less than thirty seconds. Anyway, oh, yeah. but but that's that all plays a key role in the economic ecosystem in terms of whenever you have either more players in the marketplace or in the case of cell phones you have an abundance of products and you have the accessibility of technology because what was happening was advancements in technology internet voice over ip um, wireless um, companies were building more towers when you build more cell towers you have a higher capacity so that you can build more cell phones so that they won't drop because you have to remember businesses can't just expand and just build millions of products it also has to be proven that those products work and so you can't build from one cell phone to a network of a billion and expect a seamless transition you have to make sure you scale as um, you're able to build the infrastructure so that you won't ruin your reputation because once you're in the competitive race and you have a poor reputation of being cheap or unreliable, that would do you worse. Um, that'd do you more harm than not being available to you. So all of those are very important. Let me let me play this second video and then we'll wrap up the last few slides. Slide six is a competition slide. This is another slide that's really misused on our pitch decks and causes troubles for investors. The purpose of it is to outline the space, ecosystem, industry you're going to operate in and why you're different. You don't want to list every potential you know, competitors there. And you also don't want to say there's never you know, any competitors. There's always potential mm -hmm. competitors in your space. They may not be there yet, but they could be. So the, you know, the idea is where, identify where you're going to be competing, identify who are the major players, who are the potential entrants in it, um, and then show how you're different. So tables and matrices work really well in this circumstance. So you could do an X and Y where you know, they're really custom and you know, uh, really mass market products and you're more on the custom and you can use bubbles. There's a lot of standard you know, ways to show competitors. Um, in a simple table way, you could just list your name and then you know, 10 of the major competitors you see and then your different functionalities or target audiences, the check boxes or Xs. It's really your choice how to do it. The goal again is just to come back, is let me see where the market you're playing in, that there are established players, because if there's no players in there, if you truly can say there's no competitors, this sounds kind of counterintuitive, but investors are gonna say, 
mm, I wonder if there's, it's really a market that exists anyways. If there's mm. no one, you know. So if you can say it's a market that's already billion dollar players, that actually attracts investors that this might be a good solution if you truly are doing it different in a way that customers, their potential users are value. Good deal. So the purpose of that slide, of that video presentation was to uh, illustrate what my expectations are for your competition slide for your final exam. So you don't need to, you don't need to create a slide for your midterm, but in December for your final presentation with your group, you want to be very succinct on the type of slide you, you, that you create. You want to be clear. You don't have to state every single competitor, but I do want you to state your top two or three competitors that you researched and have some highlights on how you are different than they are. Um, but we'll we'll discuss that later on in the semester. And you will have access to this video um, afterwards. Now, before we end, um, I want to quickly state um, how I would my expectations for your competition slot side, your competition portion of your of your midterm and your final. For your competition side uh, section. For your midterm, it's going to be one page. For your final, it'll be two pages. And um, I'll be expecting you to state who you are directly or indirectly competing with. Um, I want you to provide their addresses. Now, we're not, we're not, I don't assume that you all are going to start a real business, but you will have an idea where you will want to have your business start. Um, if, it's a, if it's an online business, Please state the, uh, their email addresses, state their demographics, state their geotags, right? If you want to do a brick and mortar business, like a restaurant or insurance agency, things of that nature, identify what area in Dallas or in the North Texas region you want to locate your business, and then identify your competitors within a reasonable um, geo um, location area. So, for example, if you are in, or if you want to build your business in Arlington, and you want to cover all of North Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, as south far south as Wasahatchee, or Hillsboro as far north as Denton, um, and there are ten competitors within that region, um, find th two or three competitors and go deep of your most. Uh, Threatened, com threatening competitors and identify those. I want you to state how will your product compare to your competition. I want you, and that's what the, the last presentation stated. I want you to let me know what differentiates your product from your competitors. Qual in quality, um, sometimes your com competition may have less quality. They may have more quality, but you may have a, com a comparable advantage on price, right? Or if you're a higher quality product, you may have a higher price for a reason, right? And you may just want to identify a specific demographic. I want you to clearly state those, clearly state your niche. And I want you to use the competitive analysis, which we showed you last week. Um, and I don't want you to have this actual graph I don't want you to create these boxes and just fill them in and submit them to me. I want your group to fill it in and I want you to write an analysis based on how you filled this in with the competitor A and competitor B for an, a page analysis. Does that make sense? All right. If y'all don't have, if you have any other questions with that, please let me know. I have one more slide I want to show you. I showed this to you all. Um, last week as well. Remember, state directly who would be, who would, uh, oh, we've already talked about all that. Okay. Are there any questions? No. Oh, there was one question. Jeanette had a question on the chat box I want to address. Um, thank you, Jeanette, for it. Um, her question was involving identifying um, opportunities in economic and regulatory trends, that assignment. Um, your question is, for the two economic trends, is it just anything that is trending right now in the economy? Uh, and talk about, yes, anything that's trending 
right now on this in the economy and just discuss it and explain what a regulatory change is. A, regular, a regulatory change is something that because of either, and this is my definition, this is not a, um, a textbook definition, this is my interpretation, is anything that from environment or from the environment or something culturally that causes change um, that's in a semi-permanent basis, well, after that change happens, in order for our society, in order for our culture to sustain that change for the benefit of all good, there's then research to create policies and practices to ensure that continues to happen. So a great example um, is marijuana. Marijuana in the last, since in the, in the, since, uh, in the late 50s, no, since the mid 60s. It's been taboo in our country um, for marijuana consumption up until maybe 20 years ago where a few states started accepting medicinal usage and then that evolved into recreational uses. Well, that is a change in our country. So a regulatory change is individual governments or state governments creating laws to make marijuana legal in that particular state or regulatory change that state of Texas will uh, endorse the sale of CBD, but not THC. Those are regulatory changes because it's changing our society now because we're consuming something totally different. But in order for this to be sustainable, you have to write it into law, or write it into some sort of some sort of regulation so that we can adopt it. Does that answer your question, um, Jeanette? I'm hoping it did. I see you're still on. If, if not, uh, please feel free to answer it. Okay, great. Exactly, Jeanette. It's not necessarily finding an actual business. But there are some businesses that are, that are creating regulatory changes, right? Tesla, with the, with the automobile industry, it started creating regulatory changes because it's an electric vehicle. All right? Good deal. All right? If there are no other questions. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Alondra. So it's about the uh, very short interview part one. Mm -hmm. um, I know you were supposed to interview an entrepreneur with more than 10 years of experience. Yes. But in my case, um, I already, uh, like I filmed the video and um, interviewed um, a friend from high school. But she's only been in her business for a year. Do um, you think uh, maybe I should try looking for somebody else? Or I, I would say look for someone else, and not because your friend is not a successful entrepreneur, but mm -hmm. the reason why I said 10 years is that I want uh, you to interview an entrepreneur who dealt with the peaks and the valleys of being an entrepreneur. And quite honestly, in your first year, you may have only experienced one or the other, right? Um, mm -hmm. For me, when I, we started Group Excellence, our business took off quickly. So we were on a high really quickly, but then there was a crash year three. That it oh. took us a couple of years to recoup. And so by year six, I had a different point of view of what entrepreneurship is than in year one. And so when, I, when, when the assignment states a 10 year experience, um, it's so that somebody can experience d different seasons of entrepreneurship. So if you have an interview that they've done maybe five years of experience, that's all right. Um, but try to stay away from people who've only been an entrepreneur for one or two years. Okay. And then one more question. Mm -hmm. So I've been um, a little bit confused. Um, because on um, the assignments we have, the bug list, um, the word opportunity comes up a lot. And so what I understood was that like a business opportunity could be, I can, and, well, my question is, am I correct in the sense of what I'm understanding is a business opportunity, the word opportunity could mean like an issue. That makes sense? So, so yes, that makes sense. 
So thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. From what I took from your question is pretty much identifying is the word opportunity and exactly what does that mean when I'm trying to write my assignments. Mm -hmm. And opportunities, well, one, words in general mean different things for an entrepreneurial mind. So COVID, for example, is a really bad scenario in our society and it causes a lot of grief. But I was telling one of my clients earlier today, I actually am optimistic because COVID provides opportunities for me to create something new and innovative to change culture. So opportunities itself is just the idea of creating, uh, of having some other variable experience that you can mold and craft um, to, to determine a new future. So the word opportunity is neutral in my opinion, but you can, it can be positive in terms of, wow, this is a great opportunity so you can take advantage of, or it can, you can also spin it to be negative in the space where if you have certain opportunities, it can kind of distract you or deter you from the goals that you actually want to do. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's my take on the actual word opportunities and how I use opportunity and why you see opportunities come up often in your assignments. It's because an entrepreneur doesn't look at things as right or wrong, good or bad. A lot of it depends on a certain environment, a certain scenario, a certain situation, and what we do with that information to create a business from that. All right. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I have a question, but yes. I guess people can kind of trickle out as they want. I, it's more about the project. So well, it's first, not, first of all, I'm the only one that can dismiss people in my class. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just but, didn't want to like, I know that we're getting close to nine, so I didn't want to. Perfect. No, I, that makes sense. So okay, we'll, cool. what I'll do is I'll conclude class. And if you still have questions, please stay on the line. Um, and I'll be happy to answer it as long as, as long as possible. Thank you all and have a good night. And I'm also going to stop the recording. So it's about uh, last time's